whenever you are ready. The only, the only thing I'll say before um, the secretary introduces himself is on your desks there is this list of reports, and it's obviously um, <coughs> heinously long, I would say. Yeah. So one of the things that Jeanette's committee does is she sends us a list of reports that we can X out. And so I just gave that back to Jeannie. The two that they suggested Xing out were ones that I feel we need right now. One was a pre-K report, and given that the House is looking at pre-K, not the time to get rid of that. The other was a report on bullying and hazing. And since we have H1, the Ethnic Studies Bill going through, and that has a component of the question of disproportionate discipline for students of color, doesn't seem like a good time to get rid of that report. So I, I put it out there, if you have time and you want to go through this, and you want to make note of things that logically seem unnecessary at this point, I'm happy to aggregate those and pass them on to Jeanette and see if we can um, possibly eliminate more in the bill that she's putting forward. So with that said, um, welcome, Mr. Secretary. Uh, I believe, yeah, you met the committee last year. So, yes. Um, Thank you for coming in. We're, we're, as I assume you know, we're interested in not just a general report, but a, a couple of specific areas, one of which, actually all of which we've talked to you about before, one of which is um, the general state of staffing at the agency, um, Act 173 and professional development. Um, now the third one is escaping my mind, but I'll, I'll come up with it. So um, pick up wherever, you, wherever you'd like and um, take it from there. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm being a French Secretary of Education. Um, and I have a series of handouts to, to support my testimony. And um, I'll hand those around as I go through it. I thought I'd start with the capacity issue and um, sort of give you a summary of that, but then also walk you through an updated organizational chart for the agency. Yeah. And we can go through division by division. Um, this first document is just a summary, sort of an outline of the testimony I'm providing today. Um, there are some hypertext links in there. For the most part, those will be also handed out today as well, but I figured we'd provide this uh, so this will probably give them the record. And then I'm going to um, start the organizational chart here in a second, um, which I think is the easiest way to talk about the capacity uh, from a staffing standpoint. So I'll make the general comment. Uh, we're, firstly, we're in a different place than we were last year in terms of staffing. Um, for the most part, last year, the agency operated at a, about a 15% vacancy rate. Uh, we have approximately 160 employees. And for the better part of the year, we had over 20 vacancies. And, and many of those positions, as I'll, when I walk through the org chart, were uh, in important leadership positions or mid-level management positions. So it was, a challenge last year to make headway on some of the hiring when the people doing the hiring themselves, those positions were vacant. Uh, we subsequently have to make the statement, I think we're almost at full employment right now, uh, with the exception of one division, which I'll go through, which is the financial management division. So I'm gonna, I'll pass this out. This, all these documents that, I, that outline I just referred to, this is online as well, under, generally speaking, under the About Us section of our website, you can find these documents. So I'll look through the org chart and uh, I'm happy to take questions as I go through this page by page, if you'd like. <coughs> there are a few extra copies for members of the audience. So if I want to get these documents, they're all available online. We need one over here, I'm sorry. So on page one of the R chart, uh, just to recap, uh, in the middle where it says line divisions, basically the agency is divided into divisions. The divisions uh, comprise about 20 to 30 employees that are organized into basically the work that the agency either supports externally or internally to the education system in Vermont. Um, the one major structural change last year uh, was the creation of a data management and analysis division, the first one on the left, that uh, previously those functions were uh, dispersed and embedded in various other divisions. So um, SLDS, some of the other projects and so forth, uh, really highlighted the need of the organization to have its own division. That's not necessarily something I precipitated as secretary, but uh, with the change in secretary, 
the employees knew that this was a, probably a good approach and if we made it happen. Um, flip the page, on the back side of that page, uh, this is just in the office, we'll say the office of the secretary itself, those employees, um, you know, the report directly in my, my area. Nothing really new here, um, though I will point out, uh, we had previously, uh, you'll see, I don't know what color that is, I'm colorblind, but uh, mm -hmm. Assistant Attorney General, Staff Attorney Rachel Smith on the far right, uh, that position had been previously vacant. This was Emily Simmons's old position. Uh, when she was promoted to general counsel approximately January of last year, that position was vacant. Mm -hmm. uh, we filled it on April, but uh, Ms. Smith was unable to start the position until this September. So uh, we'll introduce you to her at some point. But, um, and once again, she's an assistant attorney general, so we, you know, she's embedded inside our agency, but she's supervised by the attorney general's office, okay. which we found to be very useful. Uh, like today, there are uh, Supreme Court arguments on Act 46. Um, so we found it very useful to have uh, an assistant attorney general inside the organizational structure of the agency to liaise with the attorney general's office. On the next page, um, this is the newly created data division. Um, you'll see uh, Wendy Geller is a division director. We'll have her in some point. Of, I don't know if you've seen her yet. Um, she was placed in this position somewhere around January, February last year. Uh, this division is more or less fully staffed. We just had one important resignation or retirement, and that was Michael Hawk. You might know Michael. He's been the long-serving uh, director of the state assessment director position. You'll see that sort of in the first row. Uh, very important position to say he just retired in December, right before the, the holiday. Uh, so that's the position that's under active recruitment right now. Other than that, um, we just have one vacancy. Uh, I'll make some... You know, talk about capacity two ways. I guess one is the positions which we're keenly interested in, but also the work of the division. So I'll make a comment though that even this this division is fairly much pretty staffed, fairly well fully staffed. Excuse me. Um, they're still struggling with a significant amount of technical debt that you know the modernization and so forth efforts uh, that have been accumulating over the years. Technical debt meaning um, um, using old technology, old systems, while at the same time trying to deliver on new ones. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, for instance, um, a lot of workflow and data collection processes in the agency were managed by standalone Excel files, not even databases. Uh, so the process of sort of doing that modernization while at the same time uh, responding and trying to build out a vision for the future has been very challenging. So I would say although this division is fully staffed, um, they're also struggling with getting ahead of those sort of historic problems and also planning for the future and modernization. I'll turn the page and go to the next one, which is Education Quality Division. Uh, if I could interrupt yeah, you sure. a second. There is an empty seat over there in the corner. That somebody. Someone wants to crank it. Mike Phil. Sorry, go ahead. The next uh, page is the Education Quality Division. Um, this division, as well, is, is fairly fully staffed. Uh, this division uh, handles teacher licensure as well as um, the education quality components of integrated field reviews, basically the quality assurance of our supervision of school systems in the state. So can I yep. assume that um, what we're looking at here is the same number of boxes that existed when you took over? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Good. Yeah. Um, the boxes were in different places in some cases, but the, the number of boxes that remain the same. Okay. Um, so this division, fully staffed, essentially. Uh, Capacity-wise, fairly good shape. Uh, we are seeing, um, this year will be interesting in terms of licensing renewals. Uh, we, uh, the General Assembly, um, maybe it was the licensing for it, I forget, but they, we compressed the teacher relicensure window from seven years to five years at one point. I don't know if that was through a change in statute or not. But this is the first year where we're seeing the old seven-year people come in for renewal and yeah, the first crop of five-year. Mm -hmm. So we have about 5,000 teachers going through a renewal process right now in the spring. So it'll be a busy time for them, but they've been preparing for that. Um, another piece of capacity issue is that we have an, an older information system that manages the teacher licensing process called ALICE. Um, 
that that system is up for review and is part of a conversation with the Office of Professional Regulation about perhaps consolidating that function with other other functions inside of state government. I'll move on to uh, the Federal Education Support Programs Division. Um, this division handles largely the federal grants, uh, food service, hot lunch programs, and so forth. Um, you know, here too, this, this division is essentially fully staffed. Uh, last year, uh, we had three vacancies in, even in the division director positions in, around this time of year, so um, essentially fully staffed. The, uh, in terms of capacity, I think, you know, the food service program, um, you know, we're operating in full, you know, staffing, but uh, we struggle in that division to uh, deliver the program at the capacity we have. And sort of my uh, sort of approach I have with these the federal sort of divisions, and this division is almost exclusively funded by federal dollars, is to try to make the division live within the federal funding. Uh, so there's very limited general fund in these these types of organizational structures. Um, so the tension there is around could we could we bring more resources from the federal government in at the state level to sustain these programs? Uh, but these guys are very busy, but uh, fully staffed. Next page I'll go to is uh, Student Pathways Division. This is essentially Act 77, Personalized Learning Plans, Proficiency-Based Learning, Adult Learning, Career Technical Education, um, so forth. Uh, you'll see there's a couple of vacancies, but for the most part also fully staffed. So um, I know you know this, but uh, we in the House are both interested in proficiency-based learning. Right this session mostly around grading and notation. Yeah. Um, but we're going to have a presentation from the state board. We had a preview of that yesterday from John Carroll. And uh, he's sort of unstinting in his view that it was uh, uh, more or less a, uh, not a legislative mandate, um, but one that the state board and the, the then secretary um, moved into common practice on their own, um, I believe their recommendation is going to be um, to revisit it in various ways. So I'll just note that uh, at, if at any point when you're done with these other things, right. you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. As okay. you know, I sit on the state board and um, somewhat familiar with the process. In that regard. Mm -hmm. So uh, at any rate, this division, um, you know, fairly fully staffed. Uh, there's activity going on in CTE, there's a lot of policy interest in career technical education, and uh, we, we operate a fairly successful staffing pattern in that regard, but it is, uh, just to highlight that, it's something that's up for change, I think, particularly with the reauthorization of the, Jessica. the reauthorization of the federal law, uh, we call the Perkins Law, that governs career technical education, so we're in the process of having to do a new statewide plan in CTE. So we can give you an update on that later in, uh, this, this winter or this spring. Uh, next area, student support station. <coughs> this is where um, Act 173 would reside. Uh, this is special education. Uh, and um, this division, um, the big, big cause, I, from my perspective, on a lot of the concern of capacity residing in sort of a perfect storm view on this division where we had a uh, major, probably the major policy initiative before us now in the form of Act 173. Uh, the, agent, the General Assembly uh, added two positions to this division. At the same time, we had a new secretary, um, the division director, the assistant division director, and the state director of special education all retired. Right. Um, so it was really hard to uh, move forward here. Um, you will see now that this division is essentially fully staffed. Great, including the new state director of special education, Jackie Kelleher. You'll see her to the right. Um, you can bring her in at some point as you're trying to bring in a new. Yeah, place. just out of curiosity, yeah. I remember when we spoke with you last, you were searching that position, or I think you had identified a candidate out of state. Was that this person? Yeah, I don't, and I'm trying to remember the trajectory of the search. Jackie did come from out of state. Okay. Um, it wasn't necessarily an easy position to fill. And it was, it was more than just the dynamic of not having a leadership in place, because I think Chris Case, who's a division director, he wasn't in that position until February of last year as well. 
but I think the searches, uh, the retirements all sort of ended and uh, folks all retired around December. So if I remember the state director position, I'm trying to remember, one of them had been under active recruitment multiple times and had not yielded any results. So it's been, it's been challenging to staff these positions for a number of reasons. So can I ask specifically sure. in, in terms of your chart, one of the other questions we had for you regarded professional development right. around 173. Who, who's, I, I mean, clearly the director would be um, sort of pushing out those uh, those goals, but who's the hands-on person who would be tasked with accomplishing that? Yeah, we have Meg Porcella, who's on the top left, the assistant division director, is essentially the project manager. Um, we, we invoke a lot of project management for complex policy initiatives. She's on the top left, uh, assistant okay. division director. Uh, we, to staff 173, we have a, a team that goes across the agency boundaries, mm -hmm. including our financial divisions and legal divisions. But Meg is the project manager of that, so she's essentially the taskmaster, if you will, and, and manages the logistics of that. Um, but one of the one of the things that happened last year. Um, I think my observation, the agency had sort of responded organically to 173 by creating some inter-collaboration among the divisions. Um, I was not able as secretary to become directly involved in that until Act 46 was more or less resolved. So Act 46 throughout most of the fall through December was the priority uh, in, in really consuming most of our legal capacity and so yeah. forth. Um, it's really after, sometime after, well, this time of year where we started to look at restructuring how we approach 173. Uh, it's also when the data division was formulated and so forth. So um, I think what happens, we had interagency or interdivision approach to structuring it, um, but when we started to put uh, more resources, it sort of elevated basically to be the central policy that we were working on. We were at, to be able to add more structure and coherence to that work. Mm -hmm. It and, suffered, as you know, from lack of coherence. Of and just one more question. If, as we go through, because we're going to inevitably be um, looking at 173 in various ways, who would you prefer that we um, contact? It, I mean, assuming that you're not available. Yeah. Well, you can still just go through our regular process. We have uh, essentially uh, Maureen and um, uh, Suzanne are the central points of contact. And okay. we, we have, we have a team approach to staffing that, so we have eyes on any legislative requests in that regard, and then we'll find the people that uh, will best answer your question. So it's really depending on the question that you ask. Okay. Um, so if you had a question specifically on funding aspects of it, we might bring in more of the financial people. Mm -hmm. um, if you asked a more of a legal question, our legal staff might emerge with the program staff. But we'll be looking at any requests like that as an integrated team. So we're able to sort of ascertain where the need is and how to, how to focus the resources for you. Got it. Senator Person. The two new positions that were created, are they on this? Are these like these yeah, coordinators? So I mean, they're down, you know, that's the other phenomenon that, um, where you see Anna Kolbach and Elizabeth Roy. Mm -hmm. Those are the two positions. Uh, the other phenomenon I should have pointed out last year, I mentioned sort of in a cursory way that we had, most of the vacancies were in mid-level management positions. I think one of the things that's happened, which is healthy, is that we had a lot of vertical promotion in the agency. But where we do have vacancies now, for the most part, they're at the entry level positions, which I think is a much better situation. Mm -hmm. okay, well, so just that page is very reassuring yeah. compared to where we were a year ago. Yeah, they're, they're functioning very different, um, really in an integrated way. I think it's a, it's a much better disposition. Some of that's due to uh, the personal leadership of who we hired. Uh, like I said, I've tried to uh, bring in some of the new people. I think it would be really interesting here uh, from Jackie Kelleher some point uh, but yeah I think it's we're in a much better place in this division the um, in the last division uh, I'm going to sort of lay this out for me in like two pieces simultaneously this is the financial uh, division of the agency this is uh, the division of the agency as I alluded to uh, that is going through almost a very similar structural reorganization as the other divisions went through last year and those changes have been precipitated by um, the change in CFO. If you might remember, Emily Byrne yes. uh, resigned and moved to the Agency of Natural Resources about April. Um, Emily and I have been working on a restructuring of this uh, division. Um, I use the phrase mile or an inch deep and a mile wide. And, and uh, 
because I have a great deal of personal affection for Bill Talbot. I use him as a metaphor. Um, this division was structured largely around Bill Talbot, you know, and his, he carried a lot of stuff in his head. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't a lot of vertical capacity, um, a lot of individuals doing individual work, um, but no broader sharing of the expertise. So one of the things we started to work on here, um, and it's still in the early phase, is just to create sort of more vertical structure and oversight and potential for teaming. Um, we, uh, I was able to deploy another position to this division and, and uh, create a deputy CFO position. So uh, we have a CFO, Bill Bates, who I'll bring in at some point for you to meet. Um, he's been on the job since August. Um, and then we promoted Kathy Flanagan, uh, you'll see on the other page, as deputy CFO. So now we have a CFO, a deputy CFO, which, which begins to provide a much better structural uh, management of the division. And then where we're going with this, it's, it's not overly evident yet, but we have basically divided this division into two parts, an external and an internal facing component. So the external component largely dealing with school finance or the Brad James uh, crew, uh, special ed finance and so forth, working with school districts. And then we have internal components on auditing and monitoring and so forth. So um, we've started to do some internal promotion. We, we run very competitive searches, but We've been fortunate to have some folks step up. So on, on this, I'm calling page two, sort of the last page, you'll see John Liu, financial director. Mm -hmm. uh, John, uh, that was Kathy Flanagan's old position. So John was recently placed in that slot. Uh, so Kathy's in the process of turning over some of her work to him. And uh, we'll have a similar approach on the uh, external facing component. And then uh, we're running, I think we're running three different searches right now in this division. So this, this division is still going through a makeover. Okay. Get five vacancies. Yeah. yeah. Is this where the uh, uniform chart of accounts? Yes. SSDMS? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. And that's, you know, so what's happening now is we're, we're addressing sort of the management structure. Um, but we had, and I talked about Kathy planning, and we have Sean Cusano who, um, you know, had other responsibilities but took on SSDMS. So he's, it's not sustainable to have people like take on these things and mm -hmm. sort of be no point. So um, as we as we fill in the, the sort of management positions, we're going to be adding direct capacity and have basically a point person on SSD. <coughs> that's one of our vacant positions we were able to create through this reshuffle. Uh, right now, we, we have people just doubling up on job functions, which isn't, isn't sustainable in the long term. I will say Bill Bates, the new CFO, is also a certified project manager. Um, he also is bringing a lot of project management expertise to the work of the agency. So he, at some point, um, I want to say around, maybe it was as late as August, we transitioned on SSPDMS. I was managing it, and I transitioned it back over to Bill. So he's increasingly taking on more of those things. But that, that too, is just sort of a temporary um, measure until we get fully staffed in this division. So I think, I think you know, I'll, I'll end my remarks there. Uh, the last piece is just on the ADS. Uh, you know, we have uh, folks from the Agency of Digital Services that are embedded in our uh, division. I can talk about more of that. But just in generally in terms of the programmatic side of the agency, we're in a much better place than last year, uh, though the Financial Services Division is one we're in the process of making over. Um, well, I'd be very parallel to what went on last year. But the other divisions are, are more or less applicable. I think that looks very good. Um, Still a lot of progress. Yeah. Uh, questions for the secretary on the org chart before we move on. So, uh, hi. Um, I, in the off session, was in a variety of meetings with superintendents yeah. and school people, and sort of in the field, the the feeling seems still to be that the Agency of Education doesn't have the capacity to meet the needs of school districts. And even as recently as a December meeting, that was still the feeling. What um, kind of context was that? I mean, is um, in the context of uh, all these sort of moving parts, specifically yeah. the special education and school finance areas. Right. I mean, I, you spoke to the school finance thing. Yeah. But it may be just a feeling. Maybe it's not reality. But that's certainly what I'm hearing from superintendents and school board members yeah. and in the field. And I'm wondering, uh, first of all, I think part of my question is, do you feel like, even though you don't have any vac as many vacancies, do you have the capacity you need? Just you know, do you need more positions? And I know you work for the governor, and you have to be careful answering that question. I get that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> uh, you know, it seems to me that 
this is a pretty skinny agency for all the stuff you have to do. Yeah. And and so my second part of that question is, what are you doing to ensure the field that you have, you know, you can run with the ball? Yeah. No, it's. I think it's an accurate perception um, on the part of the field, uh, and that's a function of the, the significant policies I think we're trying to implement at the same time. You know, I think, uh, from my perspective, I don't know if a lot of consideration was given to trying to implement structural reform and special education simultaneously while we're doing Act 46 yeah. and trying to do uniform charter accounts. I think, unfortunately, all those things arrived on the doorstep of the agency and, and school districts, therefore, simultaneously. Yeah. So that's that's been a struggle. And then factoring change in secretary. So it's one should not be surprised to a certain extent. Um, but I think the agency uh, also was very silenized in a lot of ways and was not in a good position to address and provide leadership to some of these uh, policy issues and, and to bring coherence to them. So I think it's a fair characterization. Um, I think we're working hard to turn that around, but I would also, from our perspective, I think what I, one thing I learned last year was that when we talk about agency capacity, I think it's also fair to talk about district capacity. Uh, so we, we are intertwined very closely in a couple areas, one being finance and one being you know, special education and legal issues. So when districts uh, don't have capacity, we also struggle as well. And um, that is that is a big part of the story, for instance, on the SLDS project when we start talking about collecting data. Some districts are in a much better place to do that work than others. Um, Last year, when that when that initiative was launched, virtually all the supervisors that still haven't submitted their data. This year, we just had one district not be able to do their data. It delayed us. It's still delaying us, but we're, it's a big accomplishment uh, to get everyone else over the line. Um, but in terms of your specific question, areas I feel like we need to expand, and I do, um, you know, I, I, I hear that comment come up some part of the coverage seems so I can't. You know, I do advocate for my agency. I do. Uh, also have to think about last year, my argument, you know, we still had 23 vacancies, so I wasn't in a position to advocate for more positions. What I've alerted some legislative leaders to, and I'll share with you now, I think there's a couple areas where um, we might have to add capacity to the agency depending on how things go. Certainly, uh, part of it is up to you in terms of what new policies you expect us to implement, but uh, an area that I'm increasingly concerned about has to do with district capacity. So we've had a couple of districts uh, come close to a uh, real financial crisis, if you will. And it's not atypical to find that SEAs, or what we call state education agencies across the country, have some capacity to go in and uh, buoy up school districts operational from an operational standpoint. So when districts uh, struggle with um, doing their federal reporting or getting clean audits and those kinds of things, it triggers some oversight responsibilities on our part. And we don't necessarily have a technical team that can come in and you know, come in as sort of a management position and come and say, we're going to help you run your district for a few months and get you back to the place where we can actually, you know, assure the federal government that we can send you the money that you, you deserve. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned increasingly that uh, we have some districts in that condition. I don't necessarily have the capacity to address that. When that comes up, uh, very similar to our response to Act 173, we essentially have to staff a team around that district that pulls people from different uh, divisions. So we would staff a, a district as a case or a project uh, to make sure that the district itself is not experiencing a fragmented response from the agency. And if I could just jump in there, it's a great segue. So we had uh, John Carroll in, as I mentioned. We were looking over the reorganization bill that um, right. he and Jim Demeray, uh, with some oversight from me, put together. <clears throat> so he's talking about spinning off a number of functions um, to AOE, as well as um, acknowledging that some are already being performed by AOE. But for instance, that idea of districts that need a team to go in, the state board has a red flag um, scenario where they would go into right. independent schools, yeah. um, where that would now be, as I understand it, that would be AOE um, that would pick that up. So. If we go forward with that, it adds to your capacity worries. So just take that one example. Now you're not just worried about red flag public school districts, right. but red flag independent school districts. Um, can you can you accomplish 
just the $64,000 question. Yeah. Do you need more people to accomplish the reorganization that John Carroll's talking about? Yeah, that's, that's a larger topic, I think, mm -hmm. but just to take it on a narrow example, um, this summer we had, you know, say, the red flag threshold with the Compass School. Yeah. Okay. So um, what we did inside the agency, I'll just uh, eliminate the state board's role for a minute, is we reached out to the Department of Financial Regulation for some support on that. Mm -hmm. state, you know, we, we use an opportunity like that to uh, revisit all our regulations and maybe uh, look for an opportunity to, to take away what we've learned from the experience to scale, because we are in the process of rewriting the rules for independent school oversight mm -hmm. for special ed and general education mm -hmm. as part of 173. So I think we had excellent response from DFR to do that, and we were able to support the, the state board in going doing a site visit and so forth. I would argue we could do that more efficiently without the state board's involvement. You know, we could do that site visit. We have an AOE staff member involved with DFR. We basically doing the aspect that would be involved in the state board adds a whole layer of process to what otherwise would be much more direct conversation with the school. So I'm not, I'm not convinced that that can't be more simplified and therefore give us greater capacity. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the, this idea of a red flag, our current authority in terms of dealing with public schools is really restricted to meeting the school quality standards or not. And that, that triggers uh, under ESSA, we have under that uh, Federal Education Program Division, we have this technical support staff that deal with districts that aren't uh, providing good outcomes for students or mm -hmm. need support in doing that. We don't have threshold things for operational issues. You know, and that's that's my concern, is that mm -hmm. when we do start talking about, for instance, not getting an audit, um, the red flags become immediate, and with the federal government breathing down our backs, and we have to go in pretty strongly. We don't have right. any sort of gray nuance area where we can coach you through process, and we don't have people to put on the ground in your central office to help you. It's more or less immediately going to accountability, saying, you know, we send you a formal letter, you come in and present your case, and then mm -hmm. you know, at some point we say you can't accept federal money anymore. Um, so I, I worry about not having capacity in between there, and when we, when we think about defining what those red flag <coughs> thresholds might be, I think we are going to have to contemplate the operational red flags, which I don't think we have in our portfolio right now. It's really based on quality standards and student performance. Well, I will I'll offer it and leave the offer open to session we, I believe, are going to move a version of that reorganization yeah. bill. It seems to me um, John Carroll was um, open to the idea of not pushing for resources for the state board um, because we pointed out that he was spinning off a number of duties. It's an odd time to ask for more staff right. when, you, when you reduce your load. Um, but obviously AOE is increasing its load. So there, I can see an opportunity in that bill to add an appropriations yeah. section where we would, um, you know, if you identified a position or two that were necessary to accomplish this right. work, that might be worth thinking about. Yeah, I, I mentioned that I think there are two areas where um, we need additional or would need additional capacity. One is the sort of, I don't know if I qualify this uh, technical support for operational capacity of districts. Mm -hmm. I think the other is I mean, one of the areas that attracted me to this work is um, adding more policy horsepower to the agency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, take this very specific specific issue of the state board. Um, we certainly, you know, we're in a position to support the state board in advancing their topic, and I'm a non-voting member of the board, so I don't mm -hmm. I don't try to weigh in too strongly in that. Other than try to facilitate their conversation, be clear about what they're trying to achieve. But when it comes time to turning uh, their proposal into actionable and, and right. correct legislation, I mean, that's where we have, we don't sometimes have adequate editorial horsepower to say, you know, you have limited capacity in your ledge council. We don't have necessarily adequate capacity to design policy. Mm -hmm. um, but I think one of the lenses I would put on the table in terms of um, considering the state board's approach is, you know, we should endeavor to get better quality education policy enacted in the state. And when I say policy, it's not just statute, it's also regulation. And um, I'm, not, I'm not convinced we have high quality regulation on our side, and part of that's due to the political process with the state board and, and how that rolls out. We can talk about proficiency-based learning as being a good case study in that. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, regulation is a critical piece of a lot of aspects of enacting the, the goals of legislation. And uh, right now, the, the regulatory process is rather chaotic in education. And um, 
I think we, there's a lot that we can do to streamline that and work to create more effective regulation. I think we would need additional horsepower to do some of that. If, I'm, not, I'm not convinced the state board, uh, as a lay board, is the correct body to do regulation. Yes. Yeah. So. No, I agree. Um, if, you've, if you feel you've thought through those positions well enough to commit them to paper, um, if, if you want to produce descriptions of the, you know, sure. such that we could put it into an appropriations section and send them to Jim Demeray, I'll have him at it. Okay. We'll just talk about that as a condition of passage of that bill with the idea that we'll take testimony on it. And, but um, it seems to me that resources are an issue. I just don't think putting them in the state board at that moment is the, is the way to go. I think it's, it's a perfect opportunity to argue that um, AOE is streamlining, but also taking on work and needs. To yeah, it's, it's part of it's a diagnosis of what's in front of us as a state. Yeah. You know, and, and what I've learned, and I think many of us are appreciating, we're, we're in a bit of a demographic crisis, as the governor would observe, but mm -hmm. I, I think all policymakers sort of agree to that. Um, we have some work in front of us that's going to require some real structural change. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, then my conclusion is the agency's going to need some capacity to do that, mm -hmm. a structural change. And that structural change is, is political, but it's also technical, and that's yeah. where the regulation on the technical side needs to be embellished. Just an, another area that I've heard in the field that you seem to be lacking is um, anybody who does um, facilities work. I throw that into that same operational pick out category. Okay, yeah. and then um, I, I think this has come up specific to special ed, but more broadly is um, professional development and teacher education work. That's yeah. another area that I've. Yeah, actually, that's, that's where I wanted to go yeah, we're next. Go okay. next. Yeah. So good, good okay. connection. Where are we on yep. 173 and? So the uh, the. Um, School construction, I'm looking over the operational okay. side. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's an important, if you heard the radio this morning, you know, it's, it's something that's heating up very quickly. Yeah, it is. Uh, the agency at one point, we operated a program, we had three staff to help support that. Uh, what but, program? You know, what school? School construction program, yeah. Uh, so we're, we have, we have a, once again, indicative, I think, of some of the structural work that's in front of us. Uh, to do that, we're going to need some capacity to do this. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about, I'm going to shift over to professional development aspect, I sort of call the program side of 173. Um, you know, just, I'm going to talk to a couple things on this. Uh, what's coming around is a summary we did for the uh, census-based advisory group. Um, uh, sort of, this is a quick list of sort of the discrete activities um, that we've been involved in. And we provided a similar list to this committee um, last spring. I think before, I would say before we had real coherence on sort of what, what we thought the course of action should be on the programmatic side. So these are, you know, we're, I guess the question is we're very easily able to produce a list of activities we support and provide. To what extent those could be considered to be coherent and impactful, I guess that would be the bigger question. And, we're in a different position now to talk about this than we were last year, but you, this is a discrete list of activities um, that we've been engaged in under 173. More importantly, I'm gonna, I would say more importantly, but I'm gonna pass around now. This is a this is a report that you require us to do on the technical assistance and professional development, which is it's an embellishment of that cost timeline document. And I just wanna uh, share with you um, just sort of how we've approached this issue We see the professional development for 173 uh, being structured for districts. And this, this document that's coming around is really a, a good summary of um, the work we engaged in this summer. So um, on page two of this, the document I just handed out, you'll see our theory of action. Um, what we did this summer was really, we struggled a bit to, to come up with sort of a coherent model for what the professional development for Act 173 should look like. And uh, what we went through, the agency itself went through a vision or missioning ex mission exercise and came back to conclude um, about our, uh, that our, one of our fundamental roles is to enact the law, to create regulation to do that. Um, so one of the things we started to look at is what are our current regulations and how could we use them as a structural levers, if you will, 
uh, to enact 173. So we think, under this theory of action, we think there are four areas that we're going to focus on as part of 173 implementation. These are areas that have been in the law or regulation for a long time in Vermont. There's, there's over 20 years. So it's a coordination of curriculum. Um, the, and I'll, I'll walk through these a little bit just historically. That, that was shifted to the SU under Act 153 under the virtual merger provision. So that's like 2010. Um, hasn't really been explored. Uh, to, from a systems perspective, uh, needs-based professional learning, um, local comprehensive assessment system, and then the uh, multi-tiered support system or ESP system. So what the message that we're promoting as part of our professional development focus now is yes, there's need for specific technical expertise on certain topics, and that's what that discrete list represents, but that's not in itself gonna move systems forward. The big deficiency, our diagnosis in Vermont, is not the fact that where we have a deficit of technical expertise. We have a lot of expertise that's ongoing. Our problem is that we don't necessarily work systemically at the district level. So what we're trying to promote, and this is a, somewhat a result of Act 46, is to say now that districts are under, for the most part, under one supervision of one board, we want you to contemplate coordination of curriculum now more forcefully as a district. You know, so it's really hard to talk about how we remediate for students when we don't know what the definition of the curriculum is. In many districts in the state don't have good formal curriculum. Similarly, uh, educational support teams uh, previously were done on a school by school basis, uh, which means mental health agencies, other resources have to interface with over 200 schools to figure out how to provide services. By sort of putting emphasis at the district level, we can reduce that point of entry to 60 entities. And we say each supervisory in a supervisory district, we want you to contemplate how you're going to provide support systems to all your schools and figure out how to do that in an equitable and in a high quality way. So uh, the, the theme here is we're taking four levers that have always been in regulation that really represent you know, the backbone of 173 in terms of using multi tier support and so forth. But we think the important change as a result of Act 46 is to put emphasis at the systems level and to say to districts, well, we, want, we now need to contemplate these things and enact these things as a group of schools as opposed to uh, working one off on each school basis. So the theory of action we're promoting is that the, super, the state will be working with districts and that districts will be working with schools to confront the inequitable opportunities of existing supervisors. And so the, the, uh, the, the funding for consulting and um, things that are designed to change the culture of delivery, that's going to be offered at the district level and then? Yeah, so each district under regulation is required to have a needs-based professional development standard. That's sort of been long-standing, but not mm -hmm. really invigorated towards this end. So mm -hmm. we're going to be cultivating everything we do sort of through that expectation. Um, and using our other regulatory issues uh, or apparatus, such as uh, the federal grants. When we go through a review of those grant applications, we're going to be looking for to what extent districts have built capacity to, to deliver professional development on mm -hmm. a systematic basis to address the needs of 173. Um, so, in summary, you have a discrete list of activities we've been engaged in to date. Um, I would say, you know, we did we're able to do this last year as well, but without really a coherent sort of model. Um, the second document sort of describes the beginning of a coherent model. We're engaged in promoting that as a series of white papers. Um, and now we're turning the corner with our partners and the bees and so forth to actually talk about what are the concrete things we're going to do to enact that. Uh, so the first part of the fall was really about getting coherence. And now we're turning the corner in terms of uh, implementing and actually doing the work. OK. And then the seems to me the obvious follow-up question is, we did delay Act 173 right. in certain aspects last year by a year. I know that wasn't something you favored at the time, but given where we are now, are, is the timeline um, correct? As, as yeah, we... and I did come around to advocating for delay ultimately, but I wanted to hear a couple other pieces of the puzzle. Yeah. I think we're, um, my goal this year is to achieve consensus with the advisory group to come in together and provide you a recommendation on mm -hmm. that very question. Um, the advisory group is going to be providing its annual report to you shortly. Um, if it's already, it might already be out. Um, we also have um, a schedule for the state board to launch the rulemaking process, which I think they're inclined to start, or at least uh, put it into the hopper next week. 
Yes. So I'm once, saying it could be done by yeah. December. So once once we get that schedule set up, then we're going to immediately turn to um, bringing you some recommendations on changes to the law. We had some mm -hmm. technical corrections from last year that weren't passed as part of the technical corrections bill, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like to get consensus on the issue of delay and some other issues related to 173 and kind of bring that more into consensus to you. To you. And and uh, John's characterization was that the advisory group and AOE had moved quite. Quite close together on where the, where they stood with regard to draft rules. Is that how you see it? Is it? Yes, I think it's it's been a very challenging process, um, largely just due to the technical nature of this policy. It's mm -hmm. very complex in a lot of ways. Yeah. As a way you study well, you know, um, I wasn't here when 173 was being passed, but I understand it was raised early on in that process of the issue of this thing called maintenance of effort, where you sort of like dabble the details, and mm -hmm. that's what we figured out as well. So I think once we got to that point, and part of it was the agency uh, trying to escape sort of its historic trajectory on regulation, which was about a reimbursement system, mm -hmm. but we still had this issue of maintenance of effort. So we really had to dig in pretty deeply um, to, to get some understanding of how we're going to navigate maintenance of effort. And what, yeah, I can. I was just going to, do you mean the federal requirement yeah, for so maintenance of effort at right. the, both the district and the state level, correct? Or yeah, it's it really a district level district requirement. Level. Um, but maintenance of effort basically is you, you have to pay the same, you have to spend the same amount you did on the prior year. You have to maintain your effort of spending. Uh -huh. And there's only four ways you can reduce that. One of this is to reduce the number of special needs students you have. You know, they're very, these all come through federal regulation. And is it all about spending or is it also about services? Well, it, it's, um, it's all about spending. The maintenance of effort is really a spending test. Okay. But in order to um, escape that requirement, if you will, you can if you uh, are if you have fewer students that are eligible for special education. So precisely the logic that undergirds 173, it's like we're trying to make investments, give districts flexibility with their state dollars to make some investments that would theoretically reduce the number of students that are eligible for special education. Uh, that's exactly the model that has to be enacted in order to sort of navigate the mm -hmm. So one of the key feet as we get into that, how we do maintenance of effort, the technical guidance by which we, we help districts navigate maintenance of effort. So part of the tension was between us and the advisory group was to figure out where that belongs. So we have, uh, we have to go on? Yes, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We have, um, you know, we have the statute which provides the goals and we're engaged in a regulatory process right now. Part of the way we got to closer consensus was to, to, to say, well, there's going to be some things that are so technical that they don't even belong in regulation. They belong in this category of guidance, mm -hmm. which is something the AOE can kind of do outside of the, the regulation uh, thing. But there's there's concerns that what we might do there uh, is not subjected to enough public scrutiny or folks can't be directly involved. So we're, we're there's still some uncomfort with to what extent we can promulgate guidance without the oversight of, of stakeholder groups. Right. Um, but it is, when we look at what the maintenance of effort technical guidance looks like in most states, it's a large uh, Excel workbook that we would pre-pop. You know, it's hard to put a workbook inside of regulation, so it right away mm -hmm. goes in the guidance. But we have some work to do with districts to design that process. So what we've done now is to say, okay, that, that's going to go into some future guidance thing that we'll develop with you. Um, but if you can agree to this framework, then I think we're all good to go. But there's concern about what that thing would look like. Got it. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, it's a very technical policy. I think, you know, it's fair. There's been a lot of conflict on 173. Um, but, you know, we, uh, as I mentioned, as we came out of 46, we see 173 as a major um, way to, to do some systems alignment on lots of issues, not just special education, because it touches all aspects of the system. And then my last question for you um, would be uniform chart of accounts. Right. Also delay, um, because we have heard from business managers right. and others um, on the ground that, that hair on fire scenarios. Uh, obviously we've been we've been gone and have come back. What's <laughs> are, yeah. is hair still on fire? Is it? Yeah, it's hard work. I think it's it's not maybe not on fire, but um, the huh. you know part of it, you know, the General Assembly agreed to provide additional resources. I mean I think the original design it was supposed to be voluntary, it became mandatory. No one was prepared to implement that. The model was not appropriate for an involuntary implementation. Mm -hmm. So we work with a vendor and so forth, but uh, we'll provide you some really good reporting on that. I think it's, it's making progress, but it's hard work. Yeah. Um, so 
uh, the good news is now, like some of the, the things, we'll, we'll certainly make an argument one way or the other, but we'll provide you project metrics that you can see the number of tickets being submitted and what, what the consensus view is. Um, I think Mr. Bates's leadership has been really helpful on that. So he, he just had a meeting that he meets monthly with Vasco. On, Bill Bates? Yeah, our yeah. CFO. So uh, it's in a different place than it was last year. Uh, it's still a very complicated process and it's, um, some districts have capacity to do it and others are really struggling. You know, they have just enough capacity to keep the lights on, let alone implement something new. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's uneven in that regard. But we have a schedule for implementation. The vendor stepped up and uh, we have additional resources. We did finalize the handbook, but finally the new accounting mm -hmm. handbook's been done. So uh, there's some light there, uh, but it's a work in progress. So I think it's a, you'll find hopefully a different tone. I think it's more objective criticism as opposed to hair on fire criticism. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's also we'll be happy um, to talk about this in more detail. Good news, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm thinking <coughs> the way that happened last year, when people are really uh, worried or really suffering, they come out of the woodwork and they yeah. they make their voices heard. I haven't been hearing from those people the way I was last year, so it, it may be that now we're just in a a normal um, nuts and bolts kind yeah, of yeah. I think I think they'll still I, I, you know once again I don't think it's going to be hair on fire. It'll be more mm -hmm. concerted and. You know, like this should have been done this way or that, but it's yeah. been a, it's been a much more responsive rollout and an iterative sort of conversation with districts. Mm -hmm. Some districts still have real challenges implementing it. Others have making progress and are going live in the system. Mm -hmm. So, other, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, I can't remember. Are we doing a day where we're getting the sort of final wrap up on Act Forty Six? Yes, kind of Donna Russo Savage is coming uh, in. Okay. With uh, you know, uh, final map, um, semi-final set of statistics, okay. that sort of thing. Yeah, and we okay, commissioned so. a survey. Uh, you wanted us to report back on that, so we um, we commissioned a survey to districts and did some research, basically um, yeah. using the five goals of the law to see to what extent they're being implemented. Uh, right. So we'll provide okay, a, report, a formal report to you on that. As you know, it's a I've heard big issue in my district. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and this is a maybe not a fair question, but it, I just I'm hearing a little bit in your your comments about the capacity of districts and what they're able to accomplish in the field because of various challenges they're facing. And I'm just wondering, sort of broadly speaking, the sort of state of K-12 education yeah. in the state and how you see question. it and whether it's yeah. it's stable or yeah. in crisis or what. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, we have a lot of positives to be proud of, um, but I think, you know, one thing I've learned the last year is, you know, we used, I was conditioned the last 10 years of my career to talk about declining enrollments as a paradigm, you know, and that's, I think, clearly can be seen now as a larger demographic issue. And that, that manifests itself in our ability to hire at the AOE and local districts as well. Um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've had more superintendent resignations. You know, that seems to happen every you know, other third year or so. Um, so it's really hard, um, as much as we gear up to think about, you know, it's easy to look at these kind of issues on paper and to say, okay, here's the professional development plan, and here's, right. but if districts have vacancies in key leadership positions and have trouble finding special ed teachers, you know, we, we have to really think about designing policy around those conditions, which, you know, the school construction issue, same kind of deal. We have, we have districts that are in different states of uh, functioning, and more and more I see that tracking out to the larger regional demographic changes and challenges. Uh, we have the need to partner with our social service delivery model on those things as well. So I think that's where, once again, I conclude we're going to need more horsepower and policy design. It's going to be an era of, I think, more more forceful and more coherent policy in order to, to address these challenges because they're going to warrant that kind of response from the state level. And we need to be equipped to provide the supports for districts to do that. Uh, so I think we have our challenges, and it's, uh, it's we have a lot of work in front of us. Um, and from the perspective of students, you know, do you believe that the quality of K-12 education in Vermont is sound, or uh, in you know, some what? places it is, in some places, you know, we can we can describe that that regional variation. Right, we've recently, uh, you know, the equity issue is yeah. that we have. You know, if we take facilities as an example, we have stated some of the best facilities in the country I've seen in Vermont, and we have some deplorable conditions in the state. But that's how our country has operated 
in education, you know, we leave it to the states to figure out, and to some extent the localities. So we have, I think, increasingly uh, issues of equity, um, regardless of the <coughs> program. If we think about dual enrollment, if we, you know, think about feeding kids, we have we have delivery system equitable challenges. You know, we, we don't we don't necessarily do that well on a regional basis. It really varies, and that's becoming exacerbated, exacerbated to a certain extent based on communities' of ability to navigate the demographic issues. Pretty apparent to me as we go around. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you guys. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. It was a fantastic uh, response to our requests. Um, and again, very excited to see the organizational chart. Yeah, the progress. Yeah, thank you. So, and please let us know uh, on those two yeah, positions. Yeah. And then uh, anything that we can do in terms of suggested language from the agency. We do have a miscellaneous bill right. that we can move. Yeah, as I mentioned, we'll try to bring some coherent recommendations on, or consensus recommendations on 173, and that's a requirement that we yep. do that, I think, with the advisor group. Um, and there'll be, there'll be some need to make some tweaks from last year anyway. I'm not sure delay is, is the appropriate term yet, but maybe it would be, but there's some places we need to reconcile things, and a waiting study will impact some of that as well. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Is AOE going to come back in on the waiting study? To Actually, I'm going to meet with um, AOE with um, Chair of Finance on Friday, I believe, at noontime. And so after that meeting, um, I'm going to come back in. So we will hear from Dr. Colby tomorrow. Yep. Then I'll have that meeting with Ann Cummings and AOE on Friday. Then the beginning of next week, we'll have a committee discussion about um, thoughts about proceeding. Yeah, and it, we're on a, basically a two-week trajectory just to explain uh, what's in there. It's yeah. very complex, and there's a lot in there. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then what I'm, I'm listening closely to stakeholder reaction, including uh, all of you, um, and I'm going to formulate a sort of an analysis of what I think the policy pace or recommendation should be, just from my observations and interaction. But right now, we're in sort of a two-week educational trajectory, mm -hmm. um, engaging with everyone, you know, briefing governors, staff on target as well, and we'll just continue that for the rest of the month of January. Great. But it's a very high quality report and uh, it's, uh, it really includes a lot of I think, really useful information. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Thank, mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in the committee, Andy, um, but uh, very glad to have you here. Thank you. Um, you I have paper copies sure. of his documents. We sent them electronically, but would you like paper? Paper would be good. Great. Why don't we quickly introduce ourselves? Uh, Andrew Persley from here from Washington County. We did meet. Yeah. Yes. Debbie Ingram from Chittenden County. Right. Phil Baruch, Chittenden. Corey Kerr from Franklin County. Jim McNeil from Robin Summer County. Yeah. And Ruth Hardy from Addison County. Mm -hmm. So the only thing I'll say before you start is we have a, a time certain of 3 o'clock when we have to stop sure. for various reasons. But yeah. Please. Good. Very good. I, did, I didn't know if you were going to ask for something specific. or um, So hey, I'll, I'll take a few minutes, if you uh, would, to briefly talk about, since I'm new, the sort of the strategic thinking, planning, vision we have for the university. That's of interest. Um, I'd like to give you a quick update on the state of the state, uh, state of the university, if you will, and that's the, that's the handout. And then uh, I'll, I'll uh, introduce you the opportunity for investment that we're, we're asking for. So in terms of the uh, uh, strategic directions of the university, I think um, part of what I did is even before I came, I talked to you know, lots and lots of people I've been talking to ever since uh, I was named, uh, including to Governor Howard Dean, Howard Dean and, and, and Jim Douglas and folks like that. Um, and since I've arrived, I've traveled through across the entire state, met with people, um, and, uh, and certainly leaders, not, not only legislators, but also others. Who, and within UVM, um, I've met with as many students, as many faculty, as many staff as we can, so as to just kind of gather a sense of the place. And so, uh, you know, the way that our, and I've said this in multiple public uh, uh, settings, um, we think of our uh, strategy as sort of a three-pronged thing, with one prong being the largest, really, it's not an arc equal um, and that is a focus on our students and student success, student experience, student access, and so on. So student quality to me means um, that we offer the best 
most relevant, most updated courses and, and opportunities possible for the students, um, that we help them from their very first semester at UVM to connect to uh, internships and service learning opportunities, sort of some museums if that's what is of their interest, but kind of help them think about success after UVM and, and what kinds of opportunities lead them there. Um, and, uh, and obviously to introduce them to Vermont opportunities, so that hopefully they'll stay here. It also means um, affordability, right? That, um, and, and accessibility that irrespective of your economic background, hopefully you have a chance to, to consider UVM. So it's in that um, vein that we announced a very challenging goal, but a goal we believe deeply in, which is to um, freeze tuition uh, for next year. We're not increasing tuition for anybody uh, going to UVM. And so I know that's a challenging thing because UVM gets a small amount of support from the state. Uh, we rely very heavily on out-of-state student tuition. 90% or so comes from that. But I think it's the right thing to do. It's unsustainable to keep it. 90% percent of tuition. 90% of our revenue is from out-of-state tuition. So um, the, it, it's, it's unsustainable to keep increasing it. And we don't want to price ourselves out of every market and such. I mean, UVM is among the more expensive public schools for good reason. We, have, we are 49th in the nation for state support. Again, for understandable reasons, but it's, it's the truth. And our expenses are high. And, so, but it needs to be done. So we've taken that uh, step, and uh, so that's the student success, student access, student placement. You know, making sure that everything we do is filtered through that. This is good for our students. Thing. The second piece is about our land grant mission. Um, I am a product of public schools. I taught at Purdue for twenty years and at Wisconsin for ten before that. So truly believe in it, and um, I believe particularly in our land grant mission. Senator Justin Morrill wrote that legislation that passed and Senator Morrill's desk in my office that inspires me every day. I think in, in, in one sentence, what the land grant mission means to me is that um, it's our sort of solemn responsibility to bring our assets, our significant assets, across every one of our schools to bear on our community um, for the betterment of our community. I think the future of Vermont is closely tied to the future of UVM, and I think we can help each other, so I'm deeply committed to that. So actualizing that is, is the second piece of this. And the third piece of it is, you know, how do we ensure a future successful UVM? And, and how do we get the word out? How do we, how do we increase our preeminence or, or get the word out well beyond Vermont, well beyond New England, where every state's shrinking? Um, and so I think it's important for us to have a simple set of <coughs> distinctive strengths that we can talk about easily. You know, three or four that roll off the tongue. It's not that all the others are neglected. It's just that if I go to Arizona or New Mexico uh, to, to help students think about UVM as an option, um, I'd like them, for example, to think about water. Um, I'd like people across Latin America and across the US to, to think if they want to study fresh water. Any aspect of fresh water, they think of UVM. We've got the Lake Champlain there. We've got 50 faculty members from every department, including philosophy, working in, in water. We, that's a distinctive strength. Distinctive is an important word, right? If we simply say something that 20 other schools can also say, that's not the same thing. Uh, something in the medical space. We're lucky to have a great academic medical center in a small state like ours. And it's right on campus in close proximity to uh, engineering and nursing and liberal arts. And so we, we have a great comprehensive school. And so this probably something there. Environment and sustainability. I mean, the state of Vermont is very proud of its environmental stewardship. The University of Vermont is very proud of it. And so what in that space can we, can we pitch? Sustainable farming, food systems. So these are the kinds of things that I'd like for us, um, the leadership and the faculty and others at UVM, to think about, okay, these four sound good. I mean, we'd be proud of UVM being known for those things, so that kind of thing. So those, that's a really a simple three-pronged strategy. Focus on the student, focus on our mission, our responsibility to the state, and, um, and, and try and ensure our future through this distinctive uh, strengths and such. And 
investing in further so we're doing well. So that was just a quick view of the strategy. In terms of the state of the university, if you will, it's just a simple one pager. Um, we have much more behind this. Any more data that you need, please ask me. Uh, ask Wendy. You all know Wendy well. Um, what the first part of that talk page says is it talks about UVM being for Vermonters, right? There's this myth that maybe UVM is not for Vermonters. So, well, um, first of all, we're extremely focused on retention and graduation. So it's not just the inputs, but the outputs that matter. And um, we have among the highest rates of graduation of any university in the country, um, which, and also the, the time to graduate, which means that it's more affordable. If they stay at fifth year, they pay one more year of fee. If they finish in four, then they can go sooner. 44% of Vermonters pay no tuition at UVM. Um, and many of the others have significant discounts to, to attend. So it really is very accessible to Vermonters. Um, and, and there are other numbers here that I'm happy to discuss. But it is really good value for the state. The second piece talks about the impact that the, state, the, the university has in the state of Vermont. And we have 33,000 plus alums in the state. We have a $1.3 billion impact for the 40 million or so we get from the state, which I think is great ROI. We also bring in significant research funding, which not only is money coming to the state, but also allows us to do great work. So and, and, you know, I, think, I think there's much for the state of Vermont to be proud of. And then the bottom bit, uh, first a little bit to our land grant mission, it reflects it. The state appropriation that we get a uh, full half of it goes towards student scholarships. A quarter goes towards supporting our extension program, which is a great value for the state. And a quarter goes towards the medical school to, to support healthcare. So um, we will continue to be committed to this. And so the last piece, and I'm happy to answer questions after, is that we have been discussing with the legislature and the governor and so on um, an opportunity. You know, I. Um, so every state around us and in the country that has announced any affordability kinds of things and frozen tuition and stuff have gotten more money from the state to do so. New Hampshire put $12 million more million towards UNH, and they were able to freeze tuition. No magic there. We're doing it without asking for the state to help, because the state can only do so much. We understand that. So I'm not here to ask for more money for any of that. There is one opportunity, though. I think we all realize that the shrinking workforce, the shrinking you know, population, and so on, are very serious challenges. I understand that in five years, we'll have as many working Vermonters as non-working Vermonters. These are quite scary statistics. And so what can we do, right? So I think that there is an answer that you can, we can be part of the solution. Um, I'm asking the state to consider supporting an office of engagement at UVM your office there, essentially. So, so what, what it means is, um, and if there's a little website at the bottom, go uvm.edu slash engage. Um, if you click on it, you'll see that we have like 200 different efforts at UVM that are in service to the state. You know, this is extension, this is the Center for the Research in Vermont, for Vermont and so on, but there's so many more things. There's philosophy week. There's, every department has something to support the state of Vermont. So, but no one knows this. A lot of Vermonters have no clue. And also, the farther you get from Chittenden, the more UVM seems like this strange beast that they don't know where to go. So we would like to offer one front door to UVM that any Vermonter, any Vermont entity, farmer, dairy, ski, industry, biotech, healthcare, can knock on to seek help. And um, this is the Office of Engagement. And what we would do then is to connect them to the many assets that we have. Sometimes it's, we provide data. Sometimes we provide expertise amongst our professors, et cetera. So um, the Office of Engagement is not a concept for me. I started my administrative career at Purdue setting up such an office. I led the Office of Engagement. And it was extremely successful. It was the most popular part of Purdue. Um, it was not about our providing money to causes. It was connecting and being at the table and convening. We did things all the way from bringing maybe 4,500 very high-paying jobs to the little town of West Lafayette, Indiana, in the middle of cornfields, 
you could do it there, you could do it here. Um, but to, to much more prosaic things, so little things that you might think are trivial. So as a quick example, um, we, had a, we had a church call me once and say, uh, we're, we're sinking um, physically, <laughs> subsiding. Uh, can you help? Well, I was able to find a building and construction management professor who said, you know, if they pay for my car drive over, I'll go up and see what's going on. He did. He spent three hours with them, told them exactly what they needed to do, and they were through. You know, an aquaculture company, two people was looking to locate in Indiana from Colorado. Um, they wanted some help. We connected them to two professors in fisheries and natural resources. They got exactly that they needed. And um, they've now grown to 16 or so, and I last checked, and, and, and it's a success story. So anything like this, right, can, we'd like, there's so much that UVM can do. We'd just like to make it easy for them to do it. And so, um, and I'll stop in a, in a couple of minutes here. So the, the second page describes this effort to you. The, um, there are three sort of big, big uh, subsections, if you will. So one has to do with supporting workforce development through internships, right? So um, our students I have a fair number of internships and stuff, but we don't do it very deliberately, very intentionally, in a centralized way. I'd like to be able to do that. Uh, we also need to do a lot with our employers in the state to understand how they can reach UVM. That will be actually harder in some ways to help them think about how to engage UVM students early on so that they can actually go and um, uh, right, work for those folks after they're graduated. Our alumni are very helpful and they're eager to offer those internships. The back side of that page talks about attracting out-of-state alumni back to Vermont. This is another specific project I did in, in my previous job. There are specific ways of doing this and we will work to, to, to help with that. And the third part is to make industry-university partnerships much more smooth and easy and real. The industry is loosely uh, is, a, is, is used loosely. It, it, it could be any kind of organization. Um, we've been talking to Global Foundries, for instance, right? So attracting companies is one thing, but retaining those you already have is equally important. So we have talked to them about their needs, what will keep them in the state. They wanted a certain kind of offerings and courses and stuff in a flexible way. We're doing it for them, and we'll be signing an agreement and, and, uh, and announcing that. You know, we've talked to uh, uh, Ben and Jerry's about Unilever, bringing more of Unilever to campus, to biotech to bring more of Agilent, no, not campus, to the state, um, and so on, right? There's, there's, there's smaller entities in the Northeast Kingdom and elsewhere that we can have similar, um, uh, we can provide similar support to. So the point is that we do a fair amount of this, but to strongly energize this effort so that anyone calling this number or emailing that place should get really good, solid support from the get-go. If someone, if you set it up sort of half-heartedly and they call and they don't get what they want, then they'll go away and never come back. It'll be worse than not setting it up. This is why we are, we're asking for some <coughs> support to stand it up. And I understand it's the appropriations committees, but um, you know, if you uh, believe in this mission, it's a good investment for the state, then I, I understand that what they need from you is a letter of support or something like exactly. that. So, We'll leave it to you to consider that. The last page is a uh, is a uh, an op-ed I just did with the Peer Development Herald yesterday. It's about our land grant mission. It sort of describes it a little bit more. So that hopefully wasn't too long. I'm oh no, it was wonderful. I, I wanted to ask about uh, so there's a two million dollar price tag on the yeah. engagement uh, piece, which I think is very interesting. Um, as I read through, it's talking about specialized staffing to bring alumni back, um, and then in the piece around um, comprehensive industry university partnerships, it says a dedicated corporate partnership focus mm -hmm. to be brought about with support from state funds. Um, if, you, if you had to um, just quickly lay out a little more detail, what does the money actually right. pay for? Is it, um, I'm assuming it would be housed in existing sure. space and is it all personnel? Is it um, operational funds? What is so it's a good question, Phil, um, and, and it's a good one, uh, as in uh, you deserve an answer to that. There's a model that went into the number, um, and as I said, I've, I've run an office like this, so you know, getting it up and going is uh, will take some effort. So you know, the one thing that I'll, I'll preface it with is that um, UVM is an extremely lean organization. Despite all the talk of administrative bloat and stuff, there have been studies that 
show that UVM is 500th on the list of 600 in terms of administrative overhead. Um, so with very few people sitting around doing, you know, being available. So I don't have people I can just put towards these things. And each of these needs some very careful connectivity and so on. So the, the, the placement, the internships placement type office, the, um, the part to sort of educate our, our employers about how to pick that up, and, and each of the other things you read out. So there are, in some instances, um, sort of a CRM, you know, that a customer relations management software that's needed, say a Salesforce or something, that will support this effort because there's a lot of keeping track of things and so on involved. So it's primarily personnel because you know you probably need a few people, and you know when you add up their costs, it, it comes up to that. It will need some you know effort to reach out across the state and, and assist. So there are specific pieces going to each of those focus areas, and then simply pulling these 200 or so efforts together in a seamless way, as you know, to get something off in a successful way so that it has low resistance to access um, takes, takes some very careful laying out. But it's not buildings, it's not yeah. furniture, it's we will do it as efficiently as we can. Understood. Um, so I will just put this out there. Uh, I inhabit two worlds because I teach at UVM yes, and, yes. and then I come here and so I, I pick up <coughs> buzz from both places. So um, I would say that there was a, a, a generally favorable reaction across the board to your pledge to hold tuition um, flat. I think everybody thinks that's a smart move, it's an equitable move, um, but what I will say is that there's ambient uh, anxiety about if tuition is held flat, where where do we make that up? If if I um, one possibility is that the specialized staffing might, for instance, involve maybe not in your administration but in others, a new vice president to be in charge of it. Um, I can't think of two things that might impact one another most negatively, um, other than that, which is. If somehow there was a uh, tighten our belts um, around positions, faculty and staff, and at the same time adding a VP of engagement. So I. I uh, no and no is the answer. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So good question. And yeah. obviously, this is not for this committee necessarily, and I'm addressing the Senate on yeah. this. The, uh, as, I, as I made very clear in my announcement, the tuition freeze announcement. And, and move is not built on the back of staff cuts or, or cuts, right? It's, um, it's to do our job better, as in, um, so, so transfers, right? So we can focus more on spring transfers, on better utilization in the summertime of the campus, offering more online certificate program type things that are revenue generating, enhancing our research, um, funding so that it supports our undergraduate and graduate research. And research is not always uh, a, a, a sort of uh, displacing funding, but, but you can at least support students that way. Plus, uh, bringing in more resources from our, from our uh, donors and alumni and so on. So there's a, there's a fairly careful modeling that went into it. It wasn't a whim, by the way. It was mm -hmm. The reason it took me three months or so to announce it is that every dean, every vice president looked at their operations very carefully to see what it would mean, and they're each committed to doing so. Sometimes a one percent increase in retention mm -hmm. can make can make them whole in that space. It's also very good for us to increase retention. So um, every dean has looked through what it means for them. The uh, distance education piece has been worked out to um, offer some additional programs that will that will generate revenue. The graduate piece has never been modeled before, and it's been looked at. So. So the tuition is not going to come at the expense of, um, certainly not planned on the expense at the expense of staff comes or so. Mm -hmm. um, I have no desire to hire more VPs. Uh, I, I, I say that after having said that we're extremely lean administrators. Mm -hmm. So I think UVM should be very proud of it, and I think we should, in general, be comparing ourselves against where we stand compared to the rest of the the, the world. And, and not simply in some bubble where we think, oh, we're all heavily administered or something. We're not. So, um, but what this needs is a, a doer 
you know, the person will run around the state. We have extension, we have extension offices, but that's only a very small piece of it. So I want this to be a, a, a working level person, you know, people in each of these positions that are, and sometimes it may be re-casting um, somebody's role, maybe whatever they were doing is no longer, you know, as relevant as it was 40 years ago when it was uh, done. So, um, no, it isn't meant to grow that, and I, you know, very sensitive to the, to that, yeah, to the polarity that you talked about. Good, thank you. Um, my last question is, it occurs to me now if it's staffing, is this two million going forward? In other words, a, an addition to the to the, the base amount that UVM receives, or is it one time? Right. So it's a very good question, and, and if you, I assume it sounds like you read it all carefully. In each of these uh, pieces, I've said what the metrics are that we'll track. Right. So. I don't want to continue doing this if we don't do it well, right? Mm -hmm. So I come to the House and the Senate with the, with the assurance that if this is done well, as we intend to do it, you will see such movements of needles in each of these things, and we'll track them and report back. Next year, we'll be back. Two years from now, we'll be back. I want to say, it may sound arrogant, but I want to say that two years from now, you'll see that the needles have moved so well in each of these instances that you would have thought, why didn't we do it before? The two million was nothing for what, what we're getting for it. And if you don't, you should cut it off. And I, you know, I would understand. So, at this point, you know, these are annual budgets, so we don't, um, right. you know, we don't plan for it that far into the future. I'm not looking for the forty million or so we get to be somehow enhanced, and this will become. I want this to be its own thing. I want this to be something that the state feels like it owns. It's it's the state and, and your other half, right? It's it's yeah. this place that um, is investing in it, expecting a lot out of it, and holding it accountable. Um, you have a state climatologist, you have a state whatever, this is your state engagement mm -hmm. effort, if you will, as a land grant, and I want to be held accountable for the, the, the movement of several needles here that we will identify and make it very clear. And, and I, I think it's a great idea. I, I think the fact that you've already done it from the ground up mm -hmm. at Purdue was one of the reasons why you were hired. Right. Um, and we'd be silly not to take advantage of that, given how successful it was. Thank you. Um, questions for um, President Garano. Is there any thought of trying to attract out-of-state alumni, not just of UVM, but like high schoolers that went up to, to a universities outside? Yeah, why not? Just you know, I mean, I think there's a certain um, allure to say my reaching out to UVM alumni, but there's no reason why I actually thought of it slightly differently from you. Um, a lot of things we're doing, we're proposing here, the Vermont State College system could feed into and benefit from as well, right? And so, you know, I've been talking to Jeff Spalding ever since I arrived, and to Joyce Judy and, 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 and Karen and Pat and so on. And um, I think that, again, I see the, and I'm digressing a little bit, sorry. Um, the, I see the education thing on, in the state as a spectrum. Certainly there's the K through 12, but you know, there's the two year um, associate's degree type things that are sorely needed in some spaces. Um, there's four year degrees, there's more. So I think the sooner we think of it all as one, mm -hmm family one spectrum that we're all offering, the more effective we'll be and the more efficient we'll be. And so all of those pieces could certainly fit into this. Yeah. If, if there is willingness on that side, on, on what, whichever side we're working to, I would love to work with schools. I'd love to work with St. John's Berry Academy. I mean, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to help with each of these things. Okay. So we are at time, and I appreciate you fitting into that time. It's a particularly weird day where the chair and the vice chair both have uh, appointments of the committee no and can't really continue beyond it. Um, but thank you so much. Thank and you. we will, um, in terms of that letter of support, we have a couple of pieces of legislation we're moving that we need to communicate with the Appropriations Committee about anyway. So uh, we will have a discussion as we go forward. And, um, and generate that letter later on. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anything more we can provide in terms of clarity, um, details, um, you can reach me easily. Wendy is uh, obviously here all the time, so please do. Do you have a couple minutes to say if they have any that I have to Sure, okay.